Hey, welcome to Sociology. Today's our discussion on social control and deviance. This is chapter 8 in Sociology. And let's see. So we're going to talk about social control is when people generally follow social norms and expect others to do as well because they have internalized the norms that they are, feel are useful and appropriate. When a person is not internalized a norm, society uses sanctions to motivate his or her conformity. Sanctions can be positive or negative, formal or informal. Social control is necessary to ensure that a society functions smoothly. So the main idea for this section is that norms must be followed for a society to run smoothly. And they are enforced through the internalization and sanctions. So in your notes and completion of this section, you should have how do social norms become internalized? What are the differences between positive and negative sanctions and between formal and informal sanctions? What is social control? Every society has norms that must be upheld to run smoothly. Internalization is the process by which norm becomes a part of an individual's personality, thus conditioning the individual to conform to society's expectations. Sitting in the chair instead of on the floor, stopping at a red light, showing respect to your elders, allowing the pregnant woman to have your seat on the bus, these are all societal norms. Positive sanctions, an action that rewards a particular kind of behavior. Examples include teacher giving good grades or cheers from your teammates for doing well in the game. Negative sanctions are a punishment or a threat of punishment used to enforce conformity. For instance, a parking ticket or ridicule for doing poorly. Formal sanctions, a reward or punishment is given by a formal organization or regulatory agency. Examples include schools giving high or low grades or a business giving a raise or firing a worker. Informal sanctions, an informal sanction is a spontaneous expression of approval or group by an individual or a group. Examples include a standing ovation or gossip. Social control. Social control is enforcing norms through either internal or external means. Primary means is self-control. Other agents use sanctions. Police, religious figures, family, peer group, and public opinion all are uh, uh, agents of maintaining social control and social order. Behavior that violates a society's basic norms jeopardizes the social no order and causes these people to seek you out to uh, maintain order. Uh, in the United States, the death penalty is considered the ultimate sanction. The sanction has been used since ancient times to punish murderers and other criminals. Its morality is debated today. Many nations have banned the death penalty through the United States, though the United States still allows it. Opposition to the death penalty first arose during the Enlightenment, which resulted in limiting its use. Venezuela became the first country to ban the practice. By 2007, two-thirds of the nations had banned the practice. Critics claim the practice is immoral and ineffective and cannot be administered fairly. Its supports, support for the death penalty remains strong within the United States.
Section 2, Deviance. Deviance is any behavior that violates significant social norms. Deviance can serve positive functions such as clarifying the norms, unifying the group, diffusing tension, promoting social change, and providing jobs. Functionalist conflict theories and interactionists offer different theories to explain deviance. So the main idea of this section is that deviance is a behavior that violates a social norm and serves a purpose of society. Sociologists have many theories to explain deviant behavior. How do sociologists identify the nature of deviance? What are the social functions of deviance? And how do the theories that have been proposed to explain deviance compare? These are the things that you need to have included in your notes upon completion of this section. Behavior, the nature of, of deviance that violates significant norms is called deviance. Some norms deal with fairly insignificant behaviors because they are so many norms, occasional violations are unavoidable. Behaviors are deemed, de deemed deviant differ across times, cultures, and situations. The label of deviance. Individuals must be caught committing a deviant act and be stigmatized by society. A stigma is a mark of social disgrace that sets the deviant apart from the rest of the society, sort of like the Scarlet A, if, if, for those of you who have read the Scarlet Letter. Uh, sociologists usually refer to the negative social reactions that people receive. Deviance has some uses in society. Deviance helps to clarify norms, unify the group, diffuse tension, and promote social change. It's, it serves to define the boundaries of the acceptable behavior. Punishment of deviance can prevent others from the same deviance. It draws lines of society and outsiders. It displays of minor deviance diffused tensions. And deviance provides legitimate jobs such as lawyers and police and social workers. The three sociological perspectives that explain the causes and uses of deviance. Strain theory is the functionalist perspective, is the natural outgrowth of values, norms, and structure of society. Pressure on the individuals to meet the standards that they can't meet. Anomi is the norms of society of unclear or no longer apply. Results in confusion over the rules or behavior. Five modes of adaption or reactions to societal norms are conformity, acceptance of the goals and methods of reaching them, innovation, acceptance of the goals are not, not means by reaching them, ritualism, abandon the goals but maintain expected behavior, retreatism, reject both goals and means of reaching them, and rebellion, seek to substitute new goals and means for ex uh, for existing goals and means. These are the five modes of adaption or reactions to societal norms. Merton's strain theory of deviance. Merton suggested five responses to the strain theory that individuals feel when they attempt to meet cultural goal of economic success through approved norm of hard work. A mode of adaption would be conformity that accepts the cultural goals and pursues them through culturally approved ways. It seeks goals, the culture's goals, and it follows the culture's norms. Innovation accepts cultural goals, but just disappear, uh, disapproved ways of achieving them. It does seek cultural goals, but no, it doesn't follow culture's norms. Ritualism abandons cultural goals, but continues to follow society's norms. It doesn't seek culture's goals, and it does follow culture's norms. Retreatism abandons cultural goals and the approved ways of achieving them. It doesn't seek culture's goals, and it doesn't follow the cultural norms. Rebellion, it challenged the cultural goals and norms and substitute new ones. 
No, it tries to replace the cultural goals and it doesn't follow cultural norms. It tries to replace them. Conflict perspective. Conflict uh, sees deviance uh, as the social life is a struggle between the ruling classes and lower classes. Conflict perspective says people commit deviant acts to gain or maintain power. The ruling class deems any behavior that threatens its power as deviant. The interactionist perspective. Three major explanations control cultural transmission theory and labeling theory. Cultural theory states that deviance is normal and studies why people conform. It states that people conform when they have strong ties to the community. Cultural transmission theory states that deviance is a learned behavior. Deviants are socialized into deviant behavior instead of acceptable behavior. Individuals will adopt the behavior and goals of whomever they are in contact with. Differential association, the, the relative closeness to deviant and non-deviant individuals. Labeling theory focuses on how people come to be labeled deviant and suggests that there are two types of deviants. Primary deviance is the occasional violation of norms neither self nor society labels person as deviant. Secondary deviance as a lifestyle both self and society label the purpose as deviance. So from the functionalist perspective, deviance is a natural part of society. It serves positive functions such as clarifying social norms as well as negative ones. Deviance results from the strain of goals incompatible with the available means of achieving them. Conflict perspective. Deviance is a result of competition and social inequality. People with the power commit deviant acts to hold on to power. They also label as deviant behavior that threatens them. Those without power commit deviant acts to obtain economic rewards or relieve their feelings of powerlessness. The interactionist perspective is among the individual's influences of deviance. The control theory suggests that strong social bonds make people conform to norms and refrain from deviance. Cultural transmission theory proposes that deviance is learned behavior. Labeling theory examines how individuals are identified as deviant. Section three, crime. Crime affects everyone in the United States, some as victims, some as criminals, and some as observers. Crimes are grouped into five categories, violent crime, property crime, victimless crime, white collar crime, and organized crime. Crime statistics are gathered and reported by two main sources, the Uniform Crime Reports and the National Crime Victimization Survey. The criminal justice system made up of, of the police the courts in corrections deals with crimes that have been committed and reported. So the main idea of this section is that there are several different crimes. The U.S. criminal justice system investigates, prosecutes, and punishes criminals. So in your notes for this section, you should have what are crimes and who commits them? What are the principal types of crime in the United States? And how are crime statistics gathered and reported? What are the characteristics of the criminal justice system? A crime is any act that is labeled as such by those in authority and is prohibited by law. An act that is immoral is not necessarily illegal. Criminals can be any age, gender, or race, although people under 35 are more, com more likely to be involved in crime.
murder, forcible rape, and robbery and aggravated assault are considered violent crimes. They make up a small percentage of the total crime rates, but still alarming. One every 22 seconds in the United States. Most victims are African Americans. The majority of murders committed with guns. Property crime, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. One every three seconds, uh, there's a property crime committed in the United States. People under 25 commit most property crimes. Many crimes are committed by those on drugs. I follow a, a, a community page on Facebook, and every summer, people start to notice an increase of crime. And they're always surprised when I point out to them it's because school is out. Once school is out, people have a tendency to find mischief. And um, that's one of the reasons we have school, to keep you up out of mischief most of the year. Victimless crime, prostitution, illegal gambling, illegal drug use, and vagrancy. Although classified as victimless, often have negative consequences on for society. Prostitution can be a problem because uh, the, uh, um, the people can be exploited, not to mention they could be spreading social diseases. Illegal gambling is a problem because oftentimes um, people are treated unfairly in illegal gambling. Illegal drug use is often a problem because we ha end up having addiction issues, which oftentimes lead to criminal behavior for people trying to uh, satisfy their habit. And vagrancy is often considered a social problem because uh, people don't particularly care to have uh, people leave, sleeping on the sidewalk in front of their place of business, for instance. And uh, sometimes vagrants can be uh, guilty of committing petty crimes. White collar crime includes fraud, tax evasion, embezzlement, price fixing, toxic pollution, insider trading, and political corruption. Corporations can be charged with crimes as well, not just individuals. Well, uh, because corporations are considered people too. Now, uh, white collar crimes are called that because usually these are crimes committed by people who work in offices or businesses for a living, not like in a factory. Uh, organized crime. Organized crime is a crime syndicate on the large scale organization of professional criminals that controls some vice or legitimate businesses through violence. Legitimate businesses can serve as fronts for illegal activities, uh, and this is uh, famously what uh, casinos are uh, thought, to, thought to have been in the past. Uh, the crime, as you're probably familiar with the mafia and uh, other criminal organizations like that. Crime statistics, the Uniform Crime Report is published annually by the Federal Bureau of Investigation the FBI uses this data from local police departments. Factors that limit reporting of crimes is not all complaints make it to, into a formal report. People are less likely to make a report against a friend or family member. Police are more likely to make an official report when the crime is against a high status person. Victims are less likely to report some forms of crime. The National Crime Victimization Survey is published by the Bureau of Justice Statistics. It uses data from crime victims about reported and unreported crimes. It relies on interviews and representative samples using statistical analysis. Police departments and security agencies in the United States are already using technology to detect and prevent crime. For example, millions of video cameras monitor our activities in public spaces. Researchers are already working on improving the capabilities of video surveillance. One recently developed software uses a complex equation to analyze streaming video and detect suspicious activities. The software's ability to flag activity that may be criminal addresses the difficulty of monitoring several screens of video footage at the same time. 
As technology advances, however, the potential application seems to stray into the realm of science fiction. What if authorities could see beyond what is visible to a video camera and read someone's mind? Government and university researchers are working on technology that would allow them to remotely detect brain activity. And scientists have already made progress toward decoding what they might find there. In a 2007 study, neuroscientists were able to look at brain scans and determine whether an individual given two numbers intended to add them or subtract them. It was the first time scientists were able to determine intentions. As the technology continues to, uh, to progress, some believe that the police may one day be able to apply it to detect thoughts of criminal behavior. What do you think of that? The criminal justice system. The police control over who is arrested uh, is often left up to police discretion, the ability to decide who is actually arrested. Racial profiling is the practice of assuming that non-white Americans are more likely to commit crimes. Hold, courts hold trials to determine the guilt or innocence of an individual. If guilty, they assign punishment. Plea bargaining is the process of legal negotiation that allows a guilty plea in return for a lighter sentence. The problem with plea bargaining is it often forces innocent people to plead guilty to a lesser crime r rather than risk a long-term prison sentence for a crime that they may not be able to get out of. Corrections. Corrections are our prisons and jails and things like that. Corrections are imprisonment, parole, probation, community service. Functions of retribution, deterrence, and rehabilitation. It's a social protection. Recidivism is the rate in which a criminal repeats his behavior. So if a person goes to jail for a crime and does his time and then is released and commits another crime, this is what recidivism is, is when they return to jail. The juvenile justice system was developed for young defenders and cannot be expected to be as responsible as adults. When they created the juvenile justice system, they recognized that young people oftentimes make mistakes because of immaturity and uh, their, their lack of decision-making abilities because of that frontal lobe thing that we talked about in psychology. New, uh, and so they created this so that they would have a second chance. New laws ensure juveniles receive fair treatment. However, some places treat young, adult, young people as adults. And uh, there have been times where you could be as young as 13 and still be acute, uh, convicted as an adult, depending like for a murder. Identity theft occurs when a criminal uses a person's name and financial standing to buy items or complete financial transactions. Victims of identity theft often lose their financial standing because of the crime. Identity thieves may rent an apartment, get medical services, make large purposes, or use another's name while being arrested. The Federal Trade Commission estimates there are more than 9 million cases of identity theft each year. Methods of theft include stealing wallets or phishing, Prevention methods include shredding documents, monitoring bank statements, and not opening emails that are suspicious. The stats on identity theft, 3.7% of American adults fell victim to identity theft in 2005. 3,257 was the average amount lost in each case of identity theft in 2006. This was up from 1,408 the year before. 166,248 unique phishing messages were detected by Simtac, an internet security company, in the last six months of 2006. That used to be the Nigerian prince joke. That I don't think you see too many of those anymore. 
72% of the Americans are concerned about their personal records being stolen over the internet. So this concludes our discussion of social deviance, chapter eight. We'll continue on next time with chapter nine.